Good evening, friends. Good evening. Lovely to see you here, and lovely to have people who are with us virtually. Uh, welcome to another edition of our On Stage at the Opera Center, our creators in concert this evening. I'm Mark Skorka, president of Opera America, and I'm pleased to be with everyone as we approach the end of 2023 and get ready for a new year ahead. Uh, the Craters in Concert series is, a, is an important one to us where we talk to artists who are uh, not only engaged in really great creative performative work, but who are in fact shaping the field for the future through their work, through their vision, through their entrepreneurial energy, they are shaping the future of American opera. We like to feature them, so not only are we paying attention to the virtuosity of today, but we're looking at the, at the trends of the future. This evening, we have Rajendra Ramun Maharaj with us, and he has been working in opera for a few years on some really interesting projects, and we wanted to have you not only hear me speak with him and he speak to you, but to see some examples of the work. So, without further ado, please welcome Rajendra to the stage and we'll get going with our creators in concert. Rajendra, come on up. Thank Hello. you so much Hello, my friend. for being with us. <laughs> thank please you. Please have a seat. And Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. And again, thank you all for, for being here and for being with us virtually. Really appreciate it tonight. Um, <laughs> seeing people you haven't seen for a while. Oh my gosh. Uh, the, um, you know, I start every interview with the question of who brought you to your first opera. Mm. So Rajendra, I ask you, who brought you to your first opera? Well, that would be my mom. Uh, and uh, she uh, loved the theater. She loved opera. And I remember in church growing up, we grew up Catholic, there was such theatricality around yeah. the mass. And I remember my mom taking me to see uh, Carmen. Um, and then also just, she just loved the pageantry. She was Caribbean. So um, that was my first touch. And then seeing, you know, Beyonce do Carmen, <laughs> that was my other taste into opera. I always loved, I always loved it. I always believed in the theatricality and the bigness of it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was so excited when I started to have the opportunity to come into this world. Where was that first Carmen? Oh my gosh. Um, it was, where was it? Um, I think it was, oh, I, I, I think it was down in DC. In DC. I think it was in DC, yeah. Yeah, it seems like yesterday. So the first, your first encounter with it was a positive one. Yes, yes. Because we sometimes talk to people and they had to go to the opera 10 times before yes. they actually got it. Well, I was, I was, my mom always said that Rajendra is the type of kid that does this. Uh -huh. I was the kid that leaned forward at Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T., when I saw uh, Cats on Broadway, Les Miserables, uh, and seeing opera, I always leaned in and um, I think that that fostering, that leaning in, was something that always meant a great deal to me because it, when I direct, I'm always trying to lean into what the creators have given me. Um, and it's, it hasn't failed me, so. I, I love that lean in image. We uh, had a, a friend of Opera America who always had a motto that he wanted an artist to be in every row of every theater because the artists lean in and it teaches the entire audience to lean in. I, I love that lean in analogy. I love it and I think more and more as we are trying to find ways to bring people to opera, new audiences, people of color, queer people, um, the idea of leaning in and finding ways where technology and the current world we live in uh, welcomes uh, this beautiful ancient art form but makes it um, welcoming mm -hmm. is going to be the key for the future. And, and such a different experience than watching television at home, where yes. you don't necessarily lean in, but lean back. You lean a, back, a and, and sometimes you can pause <laughs> yeah. and yeah. then run back to it. Um, I, what I've always loved about the theater and love about opera is that it's immediate. And you have that experience in that moment with that audience. And it can run, you know, here we have some shows that are running on Broadway, and off-Broadway and opera for years and years and years, but because it's that night in that theater with that audience, it's really special. Yeah. 
Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, you have such an interesting educational background. So from criminal justice yes. to communications to theatrical directing. And you know, how did that lead to your being a stage professional? Well, I think that um, I always, I'm the third child and I'm a Leo. And so I always wanted to be seen in my house. Um, and I grew up in an Indo-Afro-Caribbean house where, you know, my brother is a doctor and nurse and my sister is this and that. And I always wanted to be the artist, but my parents were like, you're going to be a lawyer because you're a really good public speaker. And, you know, we didn't come to this country for you to be, right. you know, anything else but, you know, a doctor, lawyer or a teacher. Um, and what, what I, I realized is that my criminal justice behavior training taught me how to look at a character. We never know why Iago does what he does, mm -hmm. but we can find clues in the play and the opera why um, he might do what he does. And so behavior always became my thing. You know, we talk in the theater a lot about the objective, the want. And in opera, so much of that is dictated by the composer and lyricist and what they lay for you to, to dream and to jump off with. Um, the same in the theater with the playwright giving you um, the words and your designers giving you the space and the physical life. Um, but it, it, it's all part of who I am. You know, I think it's a misnomer in our industry that when you are an artist, that you're not um, a politician, you're not a preacher, you're not a citizen, you're not a teacher. Um, all those things make up who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and we carry those parts with us. We carry those little church plays. We carry those first Broadway moments or the first time we saw you know, E.T. or a movie that touched our hearts and reminded us of our own humanity. So for me, it's always, um, what am I going to pull from today? Am I going to look at my communications degree? Am I going to look at my master's in directing or my work uh, in criminal justice? It's all applicable because it's human behavior. Yeah, yeah, for sure, and motivation and complexity. Did you have to push back against parental pressure uh, to go into theater as opposed to some of the other professions they had in mind? <laughs> for those people of color in the room who know, your, your mom and dad or your grandmother, your aunties, there could be off of that, you know, you're going to be this because there's a whole generation behind you that didn't have the opportunity. Yes. And so you carry the weight of your people with you. Um, certainly, my mother and father and my grandmother and my siblings thought, it's a great hobby but when it became really my calling, um, and I had to be subversive in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On campus, I did plays, but I didn't invite my mom or my family, and because they were very much like, you're here to study criminal justice. You're gonna become an attorney. Right. You're gonna be right. a prosecutor. So um, it taught me how to hustle, and it taught me also how to, so many artists before me, you know, the Mira Barakas, the James Baldwins, Lorraine Hansberrys, how they were able to hustle mm -hmm. to get their art um, together. So it, it was a great, it's been a great teaching for me entering the world of opera because yes, it is about art and storytelling, but there is also a huge part of this business that is a business. Um, and learning that and navigating what I will accept and what I won't mm -hmm. um, has been a real interesting journey. Yeah, and I hear it from, in, in these interviews, from so many new Americans and first generation college students that you know, their parents want them to do, you know, a real job, please, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and the idea of going to study voice or going into theater direction is like, that's not a real job. We, you know, we didn't come to this country to have you do something yeah. like that. So I hear that a lot, and it's a barrier to overcome and, and courage to finally exhibit. Well, thank you. I, I've been very fortunate in my life to have wonderful people who have believed in me and get, provided me opportunities when I didn't even think that, I, um, that it would be possible in my lifetime um, as a director of color. I have an amazing family and friends who dreamed with me when I forgot to believe in myself. Um, and I've always had my relationship with God, mm -hmm. which has always been key for me and my ancestors, because I believe God is my ancestors. Mm -hmm. It's every grandmother of mine and grandfather who tried and had dreams realized and dreams deferred. Those are that is God for me. Mm -hmm. And that when we create art, it is honoring our ancestors and leaving a little lighthouse for the next generation to see. You're beautifully said. Thank you for that.
So opera as theater, because you are you know, a multifaceted man of the theater. Thank you. And opera is a form of theater, but a unique one. So in coming to opera from theater, what were some of the surprises or disappointments as you began to work in the medium? Well, I think the first uh, beautiful surprise was just that it, it is such a, a tableau that can be so big for a director. Opera is so large when it needs to be. Um, and at the same time, it can be so intimate, which you draw from the theater. The, the, one of the interesting challenges that I found was um, working in opera, and particularly with artists of color, um, as a person who comes and walks with my ancestors and, and my spirit, to have every artist feel comfortable enough to be their full self. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. sometimes, historically in opera, people want the voice but not the person. And that is a very dangerous thing for me because if we're working and we're doing a piece, like the brilliant piece that we'll talk about later in Trimonesia, um, that Damien and Karen, who are here tonight, who I didn't know were coming, um, created for the world, um, you have to have as a person of color a certain sense of history and legacy and Sankofa, which was the device they used. Um, and, but opera doesn't always give people of color that opportunity. They just say, we want you to sing, we want you to be here, we want you to be there. But there's a human being and there is a line of ancestors who are in that human being. And so to find projects like that which align with the vision and also the humanity, those are the gifts. That, the, those are the ones that I pursue. And, and why at this point I'm very selective with the people that I will work with and the projects I'll work with because it is very, um, it is very special and sacred when you are working on an opera, and particularly with opera singers of color who you ask to bring their culture and their ancestors mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some of the wonderful gifts that I had. And then on the flip side, working with new, new folks. Sure. You know, it's been a is, is storytelling as an art enhanced by opera or somehow limited by opera or both? Ooh, that's a great question. I think at the end, I think storytelling is always enhanced when you have funding and you have um, people who care about the empty space and see the empty space as an opportunity for social change and discourse to happen. Um, the challenge is for many of us in the industry, when you have certain gatekeepers who are creating their art, who are trying to create seasons, connect with their community, but don't understand the full totality of when you bring people of color, say, or queer into these spaces and making sure that there are like enough resources to support the journey of each of those people and mm -hmm. what they bring and their legacy and their pain and their joy. You know, one of the things that I'm very proud of in my rehearsal rooms is that I took from the theater that, yes, you have to come and know your music and you have to sing amazingly, but who are you? Mm -hmm. And what does this character want? And what little child is sitting in the audience who will see themselves and perhaps think, this is the path I want for my career or be a future board member or donor? Um, those moments for me have been the gift of working in opera and in theater to think about what seeds you're planting. Because I was that kid who leaned forward, mm -hmm. who remember seeing you know, Hal Prince's Phantom on Broadway and being like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then someday having the opportunity to work yeah. with him and spend yeah. time with him. Yeah. So I think that it's, um, it's ancestral and it's secular. What we leave now today will certainly be the harvest for the next generation. Is it more difficult to get meaning across in a theatrical sense when people are singing to one another as opposed to speaking to one another? No, because I think that um, the composer and lyricist give us such a beautiful roadmap in the musicality, and Maestro, you know, who's always your right hand, um, will help you kind of enrich and find the colors within the palette. I think the challenge is that there is this misnomer often that opera singers are not very good actors. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the truth is that could be further from the truth. Um, it's just that people, if people say something enough, you start to believe right. it. And act that way. And you act that way. And particularly for, you know, for people of color, in my experience, and this is my, my truth, that if you, if, if you allow yourself to believe that you are a pony, even though inside of you everything tells you you are a Mustang, unless you run with other Mustangs, you will always be a pony. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what I try to do is charge my room and surround myself with people who are Mustangs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some work. Sure. So Cook Shack. Yes. And it's part of the New Works Collaborative, which is an initiative at Opera Theater of St. Louis. And I quote here, the first initiative by an American opera company that invites open submissions from across the country and allows its community, via a panel of local residents, to select projects for further development. Yes. How does that work? And what's it like? Well, I think the idea is wonderful to be able to take the power, again, I mentioned gatekeepers, from people and give it to the people who are actually purchasing tickets and who look like the stories you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. um, to connect with, um, particularly in my round, which was the first round, you know, queer people, black women, uh, and the Asian community um, was so exciting. And I remember sitting there and it was sold out. People, and like the world, the global majority in that audience for those three days were people of color. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget that as a person of color that we are the global majority, that we gave the world civilization. And nights like that, you could see young black kids, young queer kids, young Asian kids being like, opera's dope, opera's cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who knows who they'll be? The next Terrence Blanchard, the next Karen or Damien. You right, know, right. you plant these seeds and you, you give people the opportunity to fly, um, it was really exciting because you could see people coming in, and you know, for me, I grew up in a. Whenever we went to church or the theater, you dressed, mm -hmm. and to see these women and and men and children just dressed in their Sunday best, going to see these half-hour operas uh, that reflected who they are, it was really exciting in a city like St. Louis, sure. which is such a big part of the movement. And. Um were you a part of, were you, did you observe the selection process at all? I came on to direct, and then I also worked with them through my work. I was the vice president, third vice president for the NAACP for the borough of Brooklyn right. in community organizing. So that we're doing the art, but when we stepped on stage, that the audience looked like the artists, that it wasn't just a bunch of white people staring at us performing these stories, that the global majority of the audience were people of color. And I cannot tell you what a difference it made for those mm -hmm. performers to see Asian and black and queer people responding in real time and being really moved. And it's not to say that you know, there's no space for white people and, and black people to come together, or queer people in opera. What I'm saying is for these new works that the global majority of the audience are the people of color being reflected, that's the success. Yeah. That was the success. The talent was amazing. They were all very gifted. But that was the gift of the moment, that people got the performance looked out, saw people of color, queer people saw people of color, Asian people saw Asian people coming to the opera and staying and wanting to invest and get involved in Opera Theater of St. Louis, join their boards, volunteer, find community partnerships. That's the long-lasting retention we yeah, need. For, for sure. Do you have any sense whether the decision-making process was easily unanimous or whether people had, came to the room with lots of different views about what work should be done? Yeah, I mean, I think in life, just, you know, whenever you have people of like minds together, but diversity in the true sense, there's always this wonderful opportunity to have positive discourse around, well, what is going to be the first? Mm -hmm. What are the stories? We can't bring forth every story, right. but what are the stories we can tell? And I think that, as Frederick Douglass, the great Frederick Douglass said, that the thing that has kept our people and this country together has not been the Constitution. It has been friction. And so the friction of making decisions is always where there's an opportunity to grow. Yeah, yeah. So the piece features, or Cookshack, 
features historical figures. Uh, Annie Malone, first black female millionaire who's credited for starting the black hair industry. Yes. Dr. Patricia Bath, who revolutionized cataract surgery. And uh, Marie Van Britten Brown, uh, who invented the modern home security system. Just yeah. remarkable achievements. Um, was it hard to bring these characters to life? How, how do you bring to life people who started in a hair industry or a secure home security system. Was it hard to make theater out of this? Well, no, because their lives individually could be an opera. I mean, they could all be three hour operas. Um, but it was really exciting because I love a lot of research. I'm a big nerd. I love to read and research uh, as much as I can. And I didn't know about these three women. Right. And so for, if I didn't know, I'm like, how many other people don't know? And then working with Delshan and Samia, who were the creators of the piece, who are so brilliant, um, it really opened our eyes to, wow, not only did they have roots in, in St. Louis, but these women are nameless, faceless black women who deserve to not be footnotes, but to be celebrated as the queens that they were. And we really worked hard in doing that. And the coolest thing was to see little girls after say like, Oh, I'm interested in STEM. You're watching an mm -hmm, opera mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you're getting excited about STEM. And so that was really, really special. So aside from their achievement, these three women had some footprint in St. Louis. Well, yeah, they all had, and, and what, the way we did it to frame it was we set it in the Griol Museum, which is a real museum right. in St. Louis mm -hmm. run by a black woman. And so we, we set it there and in the museum they have exhibits. So that was kind of our, in point that, oh, what if they were visiting these three uh, exhibits and they came to life and they helped this young girl on her journey of empowerment and finding her voice. Wow. Now, I know we're going to see a little excerpt of it. I assume you know what the excerpt is. Do you want to set it up for us? Uh, yes. I believe this is the ending um, after Deo has gone through the museum and she was being bullied. Um, and the three ancestors have visited with her, and each of them have, in the Wizard of Oz-esque way, have gifted her with a different lesson and a cultural heirloom that she carries with her. And so this is the ending moment when the bully's coming for one more attack, and she finds her voice. Let's take a look at it. Excellent. The composer and librettist, did they bring forward the story or were they kind of assigned to the story once it was selected? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, so they um, all applied to the program and uh, they were paired together. 
And they were such a dynamic team in terms of um, what they brought forth. And if you see stylistically, what I loved about this program, which I didn't mention earlier, is that it allows the composer, if they're a rock composer, if they're a jazz composer, if they're a hip hop composer, to bring that and meet with opera. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, and allowed uh, audiences to hear musicality in a way, uh, particularly in St. Louis, that was both culturally re reminiscent, but also at the same time really fresh and new. Mm -hmm. And I, I, one might think that they, they met one another in this project, but might continue to create together because they found they could be a good team. Absolutely, and, and what was so cool was that I believe they got to connect with uh, uh, one of the answers, I think Ms. Bath's relatives, and they're really interested in continuing to let it tour through schools and connect with other kids and hopefully become a full length. So that's Fantastic. exciting. Fantastic. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So the next one we're going to talk about is Slanted, an American rock opera. Before I get into some of the details about it, all three of these pieces were part of an evening so that they, they were three one acts, essentially. Yes, yes. And the, one of the challenges were, was, as a director, to find the common ground between all three of them. And what I always thought about was I am deeply, deeply connected to my citizenship. Mm -hmm. I'm only in a country like America, as much as there is so much division in the world today, that a story like mine is even possible, or my grandmother's, mm -hmm. or my mother's. So I love this country, but like James Baldwin, who's one of my heroes, because I love it, I challenge it, mm -hmm. and I, I'm angry at it, and I, I hope that it will continue to prove me wrong um, in its essence. The, the thing that um, was so amazing about working with the slants, Joe and Simon, is that this is based on a real case that happened. And it was just kind of, I didn't know about the case, and I read Joe's, I read their book, um, and it was just so unbelievable that they, as Asian artists had to go to the Supreme Court and that the late, you know, great Ruth Ginsburg had to advocate for them and that they won. Tell us a little bit more about the story. Yeah. Give us, give us some background. Um, so basically they were trying to be able to use the name Slants as their stage name. They're a rock band. And they were told that they couldn't, even though they're an all Asian rock band. Um, and they were denied and denied opportunities to perform around the country. Um, and the, Simon, uh, who is one of the, the members of the band, kept appealing, 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 and went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the crazy thing was that when they're standing in front of the justices, like our African American ancestors during you know, Brown versus Board of Ed, they were not allowed to speak. They just had to stand there in front of these justices. And they were not able to speak, even to defend themselves. And then one small justice, Ruth Ginsburg, mm -hmm. said, cleared her throat, and spoke from the heart. And it just changed everyone's hearts. And they won. They won. Wow. What excerpt are we going to see? Um, I believe this is. The finale, um, after the, the verdict has been read, and they are um, Ginsburg and um, uh, the slants are all sitting in the courtroom, and they're just reflecting on like how this little case that started went all the way to the Supreme Court. And now, you know, they travel around the world uh, about this case and fighting for the right for people of color to use and be called artistically whatever we want. Um, and so I saw a lot of the parallels between this work and the conversation that happens in the black community with people like Jay-Z and Oprah with like the N-word and you know who owns words and the power of words and history and legacy. And uh, this is the slant. Great. No, that is 
distracting to see Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a singing character <laughs> yeah. on an opera stage. Yeah. The same designer through the three pieces as yeah. well? Yeah. So there was a, a kind of theatrical through line in terms of your directorial approach mm -hmm. and the design yeah. uh, to give it unity, even though three very different stories and different musical styles. Yeah, and for me, the thing that I was trying to think about, like the lens that how do we get to all these different locations? And for me, again, using the multimedia aspect, when the, the younger generation went to see the operas, they were like, oh my gosh, because they're so used to being mm -hmm. in their phones. And, and the older generation was like, wow, like even in the, if you've seen that little moment where the Asian actors are leaning in and the African-American actors are putting their fist up mm -hmm. and showing the solidarity, but also the difference in the struggle. And a fun fact that a lot of people don't know is that in most of my plays or work, I always try to honor one of my major ancestors who have influenced me artistically. And the struggle continues mm -hmm. is my wink to the great August Wilson, because that's how he signs all of his autographs. 
the struggle continues, mm -hmm. and he wills it. And so for me, that was for August, um, who was biracial as well. And for all the mixed kids and mixed folks in the world to know that both sides of you give you your superpower. Yeah, yeah. Madison Lodge. And are we taking them in the order that yes. they appeared? That, okay, so Madison Lodge. It's centering the Harlem Renaissance and speaks about a black queer experience, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, a police raid on a drag ball. Mm -hmm. So here you are in this piece, again, lifting up more people who have not traditionally felt at home in the opera house or in the opera experience. It, what is it like to, to be opening up to be stomping on the barriers and bringing people into the theater who've not traditionally felt at home there. What, what's that like for you? Uh, it's the most, one of the most important <clears throat> gifts, to be honest. Um, it's the reason why I call Lloyd Richards, who was mm -hmm. the first black man to direct on Broadway, my father, or George C. Wolfe, um, Vinette Carroll, the first black woman to direct on Broadway. Uh, it's the reason I um, am so inspired to call myself an artist um, because I know that, as Mandela says, we're here for such a finite amount of time. How will you spend your days? And what will be the legacy you leave behind? Certainly it is the art we do, but more importantly, how the art made people feel. And opera didn't always feel very welcoming to me. Um, and after last year, you know, working, I took a step back from opera because I couldn't breathe, um, because there was so much stuff that had nothing to do with the opera that I felt this is not the environment that feels safe or feels like I can be nurtured or grow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And although the artists I worked with were very nurturing, and gave me the opportunities, you know, uh, and fought for me. Damien and Karen fought for me, you know. Uh, Delshawn, Samia, The Slants, Trayvon, they fought for me because people looked at my resume and said, oh, you're a theater person. And they just kind of wrote you off. Even though there are opera houses around the world that have opera theater mm -hmm. in it, or <laughs> that they just kind of thought that you, if you come from the theater, that you can't do opera, that you don't belong there. And as a person who firmly believes that if my tax dollars are paying for anything in the arts, including the opera, I deserve to be in that space um, because my ancestors have bought and paid for it. Mm -hmm. And if I can in some small way make it easier for the next person, um, that would be great. And I'm really not good at playing the game. And there's a lot of games in opera that have nothing to do with the work. And so I try to speak honestly, um, humbly, and I'm not perfect, none of us are, but I'm at a point in my journey where I'm like, the power of no has become so essential to my mm -hmm, survival. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the extra for the sea. Yeah, so this is, um, this is a great moment, uh, and it's when the lead character has arrived from Alabama on a train, uh, had to leave Alabama because he was uh, coming out in church and that time in the black church then and, and now was not something that was very welcome mm -hmm. and sitting dreaming of going to Harlem, uh, so many black artists have, to find their voice, to live their truth and to uh, be able to find within themselves their relationship with, with the ball culture. Let's see. Keep on breaking. Thank you. 
did you decide on the order of the pieces? Great question. Um, I wanted to play around with the idea of, uh, I was, again, I had been reading The Colored Museum by George C. Wolfe, mm -hmm. and the idea of the time warp, that like you could start in present day and introduce the audience with the different ancestors from different time periods, that that would be the beginning, and then we could go back into the early 90s and then go even further back to Madison Lodge in the 20s and 30s, and just kind of set up this idea that with imagination you can travel anywhere. And with projections, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. very budget friendly. Sure, sure. sure. Um, so that was this piece, this evening, and in, in three performances. What theater was it in, by the way? Uh, it was at uh, the. It was at a school. Okay. Coca, Coca. Yes. Okay. I, I, I was trying to figure out if I could tell the venue from <laughs> from the from the film. So it brings us to Tree Yes. And you worked with Damien Sneed and Karen Chilton, who are nice. right Thank here, you. and yes. just so wonderful to Thank have you here. Um, <laughs> to reimagine Scott Joplin's opera from 1911. And, you know, why did you want to revisit this work in the first place? Well, Damien and Karen are geniuses. They are. And they're good people solid human beings. And Damien and I had worked years earlier, and it's so nice when someone says to you, I believe in you enough that I'm going to give you something that's been my baby for years developing to be your baby, um, and we can grow this child together. Um, and for me, opera, theater are people. It's the people you work with. Um, it's it's this industry is about people and cultivation. And so uh, when they gave me the opportunity and the gift to work with them and collaborate, um, I didn't know that it would change my life in so many different ways. Um, it was a moment when my mom transitioned. My mom was the center of my life for so, so long. Um, and they held me up, the work, the ancestors, their brilliance, the brilliance of the cast, Justin and Brandy, all the artists who worked on the show, it kept me buoyant. And I think that that's the thing that um, I, I tried to impart when people came to see the piece, that our ancestors are literally a breath away. Um, and Karen and Damien did such a beautiful job of taking a piece that people are like, it's untouchable, it's unproducible, and finding a way through our lens, through the, through the diaspora, to make a doorway. Because when someone dies, I don't care who you are, there is a certain degree of wanting them to be with you for 10 more minutes, an hour, a day. And what they did so beautifully in their piece was give Mr. Joplin that every night with his beloved Freddie. And I just, I think it's so important. And I think that's why it was so well received. And so, and I, and I always say like, you know, you judge a, an opera or a show, yes, by the critics, by the box office, but more importantly, by the people that it speaks to. And so to see people of color, particularly black women, black men who live in St. Louis, who claim Scott Joplin say, well done. Mm -hmm. That, for me, was the greatest yeah. gift. And of course, Scott Joplin from St. Louis. Yeah. And when, when you say reimagine Scott Joplin's Tree Manisha, I mean, how much did you change? What did, what did you do to it? Well, Karen and Damien had this brilliant idea of creating a new prologue and epilogue, which would use the African tradition of Sankofa, where an ancestor comes and takes you on a journey. And in that journey was Trimanisha proper, you would say. But what was so smart about them is that it wasn't bookends. It was one cohesive journey that you went on. And you kept thinking to yourself, this feels historic, but also modern. Um, and I always love when people, particularly people of color, BIPOC people, get to use language in such a heightened way. Mm -hmm. you know, that was part of my growing up. And the work that they put in, and particularly Karen, just the wordsmith, you know, like you think of 
Thurgood Marshall, and you think of you know Lorraine, and you think of Phyllis Wheatley, and and being such a wordsmith. It was just delicious every night for Black people in college, in high school, to know that we could use these words. Our ancestors used these words. Many of us invented these words, and that they belong to us, much like Scott Joplin's beautiful score mm -hmm. belonged to us and has touched every part of the entertainment industry. Although he's always credited uh, for his genius. Um, and I think that that's one of the other lessons, too, I learned. I was reading um, about Malcolm X uh, the other day, the opera, and of course, spending time with Karen and, and Damien, and, and mostly a lot of composers of colors, is that unfortunately, they often don't get their, their roses and flowers in this lifetime. It has to be years after or when they pass. I mean, that's the lesson of Joplin, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm hoping that in my work in the rooms that I get to be in, that I always give everyone who I work with, but particularly composers and lyricists of color and administrators of color and actors of color and choreographers of color, give them their roses while they're still here and just say how brilliant you are, how brilliant you are. Mm. What's the excerpt, excerpt for to see? So this is exciting. One of my things that comes from the theater that I'm very proud of is I always kind of pull my afro out when I go to the opera. Uh, I recently went and that's all for fun. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I never understood why people just sat while the overture happened and you know just looked at the, the chandelier come down or just was like waiting. And with permission from Damien and Karen, I said, is there a way for us to activate the prologue that you created so beautifully? Um, and uh, they were like, yes, here's your space, go with it. And I went down to the Smithsonian, the African American Museum, and one of the things that I was struck by was these amazing photographs where you would put a candle and it would show a mm -hmm. picture mm -hmm. during the time of the Civil War and slavery um, that told a little progression of a woman getting some water or someone jumping the broom. And so I love that idea of playing with shadow play um, and, and looking at um, how um, we could play with scale. So what you're going to see is um, their beautiful overture along with them allowing me as a director to take something that's always kind of stagnant and dream without a ceiling. Let's take a look.
images, absolutely beautiful and beautiful music and yes. wonderful images. That's and absolutely. I have to shout out Malik Washington, the choreographer, who was my right hand in the journey of putting that together and really spending time, both of us, researching black uh, imagery, um, both from Africa, Caribbean, present day, Middle Passage, to show the progression of black love, which is timeless. It's really, really beautiful. My last question. So, you are teaching I am. at SUNY Geneseo. Yes. And what is it you want to impart to your students? Many of them are watching, because they get great on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> required, required re watching. Required watching. Um, no, I, I think the thing that I, I try to instill in them is the thing that I hope was instilled in me by my mentors and teachers that um, what we do matters and what we do saves lives. And at the end of the day, the life that's most saved is your own. Um, there is a purpose to art that has nothing to do with ego, but service. And I always think about the words of the great uh, Shirley Chisholm that service is the rent you pay for your time on the planet. I'll leave it there. Wow. Rajendra, an honor to be with you tonight, a pleasure to get to know you and to share your stories, your insights, your truths with our audience here and, and uh, virtually. Thank you for the time. Thank you for being in opera. And I can't wait to see your next work. Thank you so much. You could not have told me a year ago when I started my journey in the world of opera that I'd be sitting here with you. And I hope that it is a, a North Star for other people to know that in one year, with hard work and some great angels who walk with you, that you can dream without a ceiling. So thank you. Amen. Amen. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.